Welcome to the Legally Speaking Podcast. You are now listening to season seven of the show. I'm your host, Rob Hanna. This week, I'm delighted to be joined by Yasmin Khan Gunther. Yasmin completed her law degree at SOAS University before her LPC and Masters at the University of Law. Yasmin qualified as a solicitor in 2019 as an associate at Keystone Law. She advises on all aspects of private family law. Yasmin focuses on the division of finances on divorce amongst high net worth individuals, including assets located in multiple jurisdictions. She also specializes in drafting prenuptial and postnuptial agreements. Yasmin's clients range from successful business professionals, celebrities, international clients, and lawyers. In her spare time, Yasmin writes blogs and articles and delivers presentations on family law matters. She has contributed to notable publications for the Women's Health Magazine, the Family Law Journal, Today's Family Lawyer, and Support Through Court, to name just a few. She runs a legal Instagram page at London Family Solicitor, educating her followers on the different aspects of family law. In 2021, Yasmin won Young Solicitor and Commentator of the Year at the Family Law Awards and Associate Family Lawyer of the Year at the City Wealth Awards. In 2022, Yasmin won the IFAL Young Lawyers Award. Yasmin has been described by the Legal 500 2023 as enterprising, incredibly hardworking and generous of her time. So a very warm welcome, Yasmin. Hi, Rob. Great to be here. Thank you. Ah, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. And before we dive into all your amazing projects, experiences, and everything you've been getting up to for the legal community, we do have a customary icebreaker question here on the Legally Speaking podcast, which is, on the scale of 1 to 10, 10 being very real, what would you rate the hit TV series Suits in terms of its reality of the law? Zero, because we've never seen it, and I don't intend to see it, because everyone that's seen it has told me it's very unrealistic, so I can only rate it zero, I'm afraid. And with that, we will move swiftly on. So to begin with, would you mind, Yasmin, telling our listeners a little bit more about your background and your career journey? Yeah, of course. Um, So I went to school and sixth form in Bromley, which is in South East London. Um, It was a small school, private school. And sixth form, rather strangely, was actually much smaller. There was only 12 of us in the year. So that was quite strange. And there I studied psychology, philosophy and English language. Now, I didn't know what I wanted to do at university, but people in my family kept telling me I'd make a good lawyer. And since I didn't like science and no other career path particularly stood out to me, um, I decided to apply for law at university. Um, And I was actually considering becoming a teacher uh, because I ultimately enjoyed working with the younger generation and had a quite creative side, which is you probably see from my Instagram. Um, But ultimately decided to follow, to be honest, a more lucrative or what I thought was a more lucrative career path. So I went to university in London at SOAS, um, and that was between 2012 and 2015. Um, I was the year, sadly, that the university fee hike came in, um, and I actually just paid off my student loan last week, which was great because the interest rates were just crazy. Um, so that was how I got to university. And then during sixth form and university, in terms of a bit of a career background, I had a few jobs. Um, I worked in a school crash at my sixth forms crash. I worked at Explore Learning, which is a tuition company. And then I did children's arts and crafts workshops um, around uh, London and the surrounds or Westfields and places like that. And then also you need legal work experience, quite hard to get. Uh, My teachers helped me quite a bit there actually. And I did a few legal work experiences in London and in Kent. And then Since I couldn't say I was passionate about becoming a lawyer at the time, I didn't apply to any vacation schemes or training contracts in the first or second year. Uh, But in third year, I decided to read more about it. People kept telling me, why aren't you doing this, Yasmin? So I decided, you know, I don't want any ideas and work out what I needed to do. And I obtained a vacation scheme in a firm called Thompson Snell and Passmore in Kent. And then I did some volunteering at Camden Community Law Centre which I didn't like, but it was, a, it was a good experience. It was in the immigration department. <laughs> and then after university, um, and despite many honestly failed training contract applications, I decided to enroll in the LPC. I also decided to change my approach to applications. And instead of applying to big corporate commercial law firms that everyone seemed to be doing, 
I decided to focus on more regional law firms and boutique law firms and even high street because um, I quite I, I decided I wanted to work for private individuals uh, rather than company which deciding that quite late was annoying but better late than never and then um I did my LPC just because I'd done the law degree and I thought I'm not going to waste the money now I might as well end it did the LPC masters at the University of Norgate um that was really fun and the electives were family law, which is like what I work in now, advanced property law and employment law. And they were really good. The LPC was fun. I really enjoyed it. And then in mid 2016, that was, well, so I finished in 2016. Mid 2016, I got a job at Slater and Gordon in the employment department as a legal assistant. And I found that job through Indeed. So not through a legal recruiter or a legal website, just Indeed. Um, got that and that was good, but I only worked there for a couple of months because I was also applying for training contracts and I was unsuccessful, but one firm called Hanenko decided to call me back and said, you don't have enough legal work experience for, um, a trade for a training position, but we'll take one as paralegal. So I thought, you know what? Great opportunity. I'll accept and I'll do it. And then three months later, they gave me a training contract. I trained there for two years and qualified January, 2019 moved to BLM, which is an insurance law firm in the city. It's quite a big, strange job. And then BLM merged with Clyde & Co, big corporate commercial firm, um, international law firm last year. And last year I left Clyde & Co and joined Keystones, which is where I am now. So that's a very quick whistle-stop tour of the career. <laughs> and it's a very impressive one as, as well. And, and thank you for, for sharing that. And a couple of points to mention. Firstly, congratulations on paying off the student loan. Um, I bet that's a nice feeling. Not, not leaving my bank account, though. <laughs> <laughs> and also, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Thompson Snell is the oldest law firm in the world as well. So a bit of history as part of the start of your career, I, I, I believe, or certainly one of one of the oldest yeah. um, going city or one of the firms. And I loved your strategy as well in terms of thinking a little bit outside the box in terms of regional boutique type firms. I think some good messaging is, um, in that people listening in in terms of, you know, maybe think outside the little box a little bit in terms of just getting that foot into starting a legal career and building blocks from there. So um you touched on it a little bit, but let's talk a little bit more about that journey. Let's go back to university because you studied at SOAS, University of Law. You, did you always have an interest in, in, in family law or where, where did that come from? Uh, I didn't always have an interest in family law because I didn't even have an interest in law. <laughs> so I, thinking back, I think perhaps it came from working with children and families through the part-time jobs I mentioned during sixth form university. because there was three jobs that really were with children and families. Or I think perhaps because I've been asked this question loads in training contracting interviews, it was because I really connected with the topics we covered in university during my family law elective, particularly divorced children cohabitation. And that might be because I come from a family, very big family, lots of half brothers and sisters, etc., where all these issues have arisen at some point in time. So I think I just connected with it and liked it. But to be honest, a large part going into law has to be you get what you're given in a way and a family law paralegal job came up I took it if it had been an employment law paralegal job that came up with a view to a training contract I would have taken it but I think that's a good point to mention isn't it you know good experience you know experience is experience you need to just start and you can utilize that experience and, and build on that over over time and, and you referenced that you um spent a short time as an employment uh legal assistant at, at Slater and Gordon. Yeah. Um, tell us a bit about what some of those responsibilities involved. It was really straightforward because the only basic job I had there was to draft settlement agreements between individuals who were our clients and their employers. So for example, setting out how much money the individual would get in circumstances where they'd been made redundant. I was given a precedent agreement. I was given the facts of the case and I was told to amend the precedent uh, to fit in with the case. And that's basically what I did day in and day out. But do you know what? Sometimes it's quite good just to sort of master one thing. I always use the analogy of the Bruce Lee quote. Um, you know, I fear not the man who's practiced 1,000 kicks. I fear the man who's practiced one kick a 1,000 times. And I think, you know, there's some, some something in there in terms of, you know, we just need to finesse our craft or reps and tasks, although they can be uh, you know, a little bit mundane, but then you really do become sort of an expert once you've done it time and time again. So let's sort of fast forward then to 2016, as you mentioned, you joined Han Co as a private family law parallel. What skills did you learn as a paralegal specifically in that bucket role? Well, it's an interesting question because I feel that all the skills you would learn or I learn as a paralegal are the same skills that I would need and that I learn as a trainee solicitor. There's really no difference. So 
for me, being a paralegal and a trainee solicitor at Hannon Co was essentially the exact same job role. We did everything from, for example, drafting letters, court documents, orders, instructing barristers. We attended court around the country. I was in Wales. I was in the South Coast. I attended client appointments, even took some myself, very basic ones when I was paralegal. Took instructions from clients, emails, phones, advising them, but under supervision. And you actively participate, if your firm has it, in different committees. So I was in the marketing committee and the charity committee, which was super fun. So I, I don't see a distinction between being a trainee and paralegal, to be honest. And at Hanenko, I didn't see much of a distinction between being a trainee and being an newly qualified solicitor because they prepared you so well for that. And it's, it's true, though, isn't it? I think it's, you know, I always say, even in my profession of the legal recruitment industry that I've been doing for years and years and years, don't forget the basics. You know, what I learned on day one yeah. in the job in some respects of, you know, how to, to do some of the fundamentals A true, even if I own a business director or whatever it may be, sometimes, you know, you, you do learn that the basics is just the years of experience that goes behind it, the extra wisdom you pick up along the way. Let's talk about preparation. Um, you know, how did you um, prepare for your training contract for Hanenko? You know, what were some of the challenges, responsibilities of practicing, um, you know, family law? So Han and Co, uh, they prepared you really well. And the reason how they did that was that they gave you real hands-on experience. We were absolutely not back office assistants as sometimes you would get in big, large corporate commercial firms. We were actively involved in every case. We were taught how to do client appointments. We were taught how to confidently advise clients, whereas some interviews I went to, they wouldn't even let me pick up a phone to a client because they did not want me to have any client contact, which seemed crazy to me. And they taught us how to carry out our own advocacy work in court. So we would go off, make the application, go to court with the client, and we were doing advocacy instead of the barristers, which was an amazing experience. I personally didn't like it, but amazing experience. And they really honed in on us trying to advise clients clearly in writing, doing detailed and accurate advice letters. So they prepared us really well, to be honest. And by treating us as family lawyers, for, as a paralegal trainee, instead of just trainees who are more than adequately prepared for qualification. That's why I found no difference, really. Yeah, and that's, that's great, though, isn't it, to feel that you you are adequately prepared and you can take on that next challenge as you go through your, your legal career. Let, let's fast forward then to Keystone, Keystone Law, where we, we've had Mark Craig come on the show before, and we, we're a big fan of the, the sort of model of Keystone Law, which we'd love for you to tell us a little bit about, because it is different to your traditional law firm model, um, and how your new role differs from your previous role with the likes of Clyde & Co. So in terms of the model, I actually quite knew. I only started, I think, a month and a half ago. So I haven't got my head around how the model actually works. But the main difference, as far as I understand, is that Keystone operates a different business model, which enables people that work there, such as me, to focus on giving legal advice and provide a greater level of freedom and flexibility and autonomy to me. So, for example, I'm no longer bogged down with internal meetings and strict hourly and monetary targets, which is amazing. And I can work where and when I want and how I want and do whatever is best for my client. So it's just, I think, freedom and flexibility is the key words that stand out for me when I describe uh, Keystone. It's really fun. Yeah, no, it's great. No, I think it's important, isn't it? Because, you know, we were talking off air before we went live, um, you know, how you can, you know, you can do personal hobbies or, you know, fit things into your lifestyle as well as practice something or, you know, be in a profession that, that, that you love. So can you sort of outline what areas of private family law you, you specialize in? Yeah, sure. So I do all areas, but in terms of what I specialize in, it's the division of finances and divorce between married couples and wealth protection agreements. So that means prenuptial agreements, postnuptial agreements and cohabitation agreements. I also do children work um, and particularly specialize in applications where one parent wishes to relocate abroad with their children or child and the other parent refuses. So you tend to specialize when you're a family lawyer, either in private or public family law. I've done private family law and you can then specialize within that too. So mine's being finances and wealth protection. Yeah, I, lo I love that. And again, really fascinating, interesting cases that I'm sure that come across your, your desk. But for our listeners who may be unfamiliar, would you mind explaining the vision of finances in the context of family law? Um, what factors do you have to consider? Yeah, so just taking it back to basics, really, when parties force, they need to financially separate as well. And the usual first step is that they both complete a document called Form E, which sets out all of their assets, income, liabilities, pension, everything like that. And once the parties or their lawyers have a clear picture of the matrimonial pot, so what's 
for division between them, they can then start to work out a fair way to divide everything, taking into account some core principles in family law, which is needs, the party's needs, compensation and sharing. Now, in long marriages, the starting point is that the matrimonial parts divided equally and the parties, their lawyers or the judge then needs to consider a variety of factors, which you just touched upon. So that includes income, earning capacity, other property, financial resources, housing needs, income needs, their standard of living, how old they are, how long the marriage has been and whether anyone has any sort of disabilities and then, and also financial or other contributions such as uh, who's looked after the children during the marriage or has there been any special contribution by one party towards a business which has made lots of money for everyone. Now, upon considering all of the above and lots more other things, the parties will make offers to settle their financial claims against one another. And if the parties are in court proceedings, a judge at a final hearing will ultimately decide what happens, will make an order, and that order will be legally binding. So two main ways, you either reach a settlement outside of court or reach a settlement inside of court, or a judge orders you, orders makes an order on you at a final hearing. Yeah. No. Again, thank you for being so 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 clear with that. Um, I guess let's talk about a bit more you and your specialisation because what led you to to focus on high net worth individuals and, and multi jurisdiction. So I've always worked in a team with a partner called Grania Farhi. So she attracts high net worth clients through her referral network and just by generally being a partner. So she is the person that I, I was her paralegal, I was in her trainee, and then I was then her NEQ. So naturally, her clients are the ones I'm working on. And she's also a member of something called the International Academy of Family Lawyers. And through that academy, we frequently assist other family lawyers around the world. Um, and they, when we have a problem, we go to them and, and reach out to them. So I think rather than specialising in something, you sort of fall into something through a variety of ways and luckily I fell into this so that's how I got to it. Yeah and obviously you're doing a, fan a fantastic job and you know I love the fact that you're bringing a refreshing look and a new feel to the way of, of modern lawyering. Time for a short break from the show. Are you looking for a way to get your firm working more efficiently and profitably while ensuring a better work-life balance for your team? Well, if you haven't considered our sponsor Clio, I'm here to strongly recommend that you do. I absolutely love working with Clio. Not only is it the world's leading legal practice management and legal client relationship management software, it also has a really solid core mission to transform the legal experience for all. Something I personally support. What sets Clio apart for me, it's their dedication to customer success and support. There are lots of legal softwares out there, but I know from talking to Clio users that their support offering is miles ahead of the rest with their 24 five availability via email, in app chat and over the phone. Yes, you can actually call in and speak to someone. Clio is also the G2 crowd leader in legal practice management in comparison to 130 legal practice management softwares and has been for the last 14 consecutive quarters. G2 Crowd is the world's leading business solutions review website. You can check Clio's full list of features and pricing at www.clio.com forward slash legally dash speaking. That's www.clio.com forward slash legally dash speaking. Now back to the show. Can you share some of your most interesting or high profile cases you've worked on without revealing any sensitive information to date? So it's quite hard to not reveal anything, but to be really, really basic, I'll give you four or five. So this is in the last year or two. So I acted, I acted for a very senior vice president in Starbucks in relation to his divorce. Um, he's very well known, obviously can't say anything more than that. Um, acted yeah. for a famous MBE British rapper who I absolutely personally love and I listened to his music on Spotify. And that was in relation <laughs> to his family and criminal matter. And then acted for a famous supermodel in relation to a children matter. I personally didn't like her prior to being a client. Um, so everyone would know her. And I'm currently acting for a well-known British actor, although the thing he is currently in that everyone appears to know about. I don't actually watch, but I'm, I'm pretty sure you would. <laughs> so that's just a few, <laughs> super unhelpful, I'm sorry, but confidentiality. 
No, I think it's it's interesting though, isn't it? There's a, there's a pitch there that you know you've got a, a diverse range, haven't you? You've got sort of C-suite corporate executives through to sort of celebrities and and things in between. And I guess you know they each an individual bring their own unique challenges and intricacies in terms of cases that that you handle. And I guess different variations of stakeholders that you're you're dealing with. So I think it's super interesting. Um, let's talk then about pre and post nut. Um, firstly, it'd be good to get your definition of, of, of what they are for people who may be less familiar. And what are some of the key considerations when drafting a prenuptial or postnuptial agreement? So prenuptial and postnuptial agreements are essentially agreements, uh, financial agreements that set out how finances will be regulated during the marriage and what should happen uh, in the event of a separation or divorce. That's very basic. Um, in terms of prenuptial agreements, they're made prior to the marriage and postnuptial agreements are made after the marriage, exactly the same. So to ensure that a prenuptial or postnuptial agreement complies, well, in terms of key considerations when drafting them, you need to ensure that they comply with the Supreme Court test set out in Bradmasher. Um, and in that, uh, in that court hearing, in that hearing, um, the court said something very specific and it said that a court should give effect to a nuptial agreement that is freely entered into by each party with a full appreciation of the implications of the agreement, unless in the circumstances prevailing, it would not be fair. And I say it like that because that has been ingrained into me, that part of the judgment. So what that really means, breaking it down, is that the parties entering into the agreement um, must do so of their own free will. So they must not have any pressure from anyone else or from the other party. They must have enough time to consider the agreement. So The general is that any agreement should be signed at least 28 days before the wedding. And if that's not possible, the parties should then look to enter into a postnuptial agreement instead. It also means the parties should obtain independent legal advice. So a lot of people think they can be represented by the same lawyer. No, not advice. Independent legal advice from separate family lawyers. And that's so important. And then it also means if the parties have a connection to a foreign jurisdiction. So, for example, if they were born in another jurisdiction or have property there. It's really important that they get legal advice from a family lawyer in that jurisdiction on a variety of matters, including how prenuptial agreements are dealt with there and how uh, finances on divorce are dealt with there. So that's a key thing that a lot of people miss out. And then it also means the parties receive advice from a family lawyer on the advantages and disadvantages of entering into an agreement. And they receive advice on how finances are dealt with on divorce in the event there's no prenuptial agreement in place. And then finally, just headline terms, parties should provide each other with financial disclosure so that they each know exactly what the other person has in terms of assets, income and potential future assets so that they can then enter into the agreement knowing everything so that it can then be you know, fair and can't be said that they weren't aware that someone had X million in a pot somewhere because otherwise they wouldn't have signed it maybe. So yeah, that, the Supreme oh, Court test, that's, great. That, that's the uh, thing to remember. Yeah, don't forget the Supreme Court test, folks. And uh, yeah, I had the pleasure of doing a, an event in November 2019, the way back, way back now with the London Young Lawyers Group at the Supreme Court and loved it. Went around the library oh, and all in there and sat on the special chairs, et cetera, et cetera. It was a great experience. But this is about you, Yasmin. So I want to ask about your typical day. So, you know, at Keystone, slightly different, but what does a typical day look like for you? Or maybe tell us about your day today and does it involve attending court and working alongside barristers? So. It is different at Keystone, to be fair. Um, I tend to wake up about 8.15. I work from home completely. So then I log in, I respond to all my urgent emails then. And then at about 9.30, I'll go to the gym. I'll go to the gym for about an hour, an hour and a half, come back, shower, then sit down at the desk ready for some solid work. And that's when I do all the tricky pieces of work, such as heavy advising, heavy drafting, that sort of thing. I get that all done before lunch. Then after lunch, I usually take lunch one to two. Today, I was outside on my deck chair, which was lovely because the sun's shining. Um, after lunch, I continue to progress the cases, do lots of my emails then, talk with clients, any barristers involved in the case, prepare for court hearings, uh, correspond with solicitors, the other side, any experts involved, and just generally tick things along, case progression, um, just day-to-day work, really. And then at the end of the day, which is when I tend to be less productive but I do all my admin tasks um, and I do marketing any BD work any Instagram work response to Instagram inquiries make some posts and right now um today I'll be writing an essay for a family law journal so that's the sort of thing I do in the evening and then I finish about five o'clock but it's super flexible so say it's it's I, I need to go away from four to five or three to five 
I'll then come back on, log in later on whenever I'm ready to finish off the day then. Really flexible. Yeah. No, I, I like that because like you say, it it, it, it sounds healthy and balanced, yeah. um, which I think is important. And, you know, what we want to try and encourage more people getting into professions, see that there are these opportunities that do exist where, you know, you can have, you know, you like you've got a passion for social media. And we're going to talk about that very shortly. Um, but also the gym, all these other things where, you know, maybe they hear of, well, if you go to these city firms, you know, that's just it, really. It's 2,000 chargeable hours and that's that's the way it's going to be. But it's not the case. And, you know, probably that leads quite nicely onto something that I'm very passionate about as well and really want to try and help as much as I can is, is around mental health. And, you know, this year, I believe you qualified as a, as a mental health first aider. What are your thoughts on the importance of mental health and work-life balance in the legal profession? And what does a mental first aider do? So mental health and a work-life balance, I think, are massively, massively important for both the employer and the employee. Now, I know that Law Care, which is a legal mental health charity, reports that 69% of the legal profession in the UK have experienced mental health, mental ill health, and people aged between 26 and 35, which is my bracket, experience the highest burnout scores. These statistics don't surprise me. And then if you look at the Legal Trends report, 86% 86% of lawyers work outside of their typical work day um, with 73%, I think it is, regularly working during weekends. Again, very normal. If you speak to most lawyers, that's going to be the case. So it, it's terrible statistics and the importance of mental health and work-life balance for an employee, I think, is obvious. So I'm not going to go into those, but for an employer to ensure that their employee has good mental health, super important because... If they don't do everything they can to foster and promote good mental health and good mental health policies and practices in their workplace and a good work-life balance, they'll see a number of things happen, which we could probably all guess, lower productivity, lower retention rates, lower recruitment rates, lower morale across the firm, which then brings more people down. And ultimately, which is what, you know, let's be honest, employers are uh, thinking about, lower profitability. So super important. And the mental health course I did, that was three days. It was it was tough emotionally. Um, there was lots of group discussions. Lots of people in that course have had pretty severe things happen to them or know of people, and it was eye opening. But it taught me a lot of skills, how to deal with certain things. I have you know constant training to do all the time, and I'm not actively using it in you know I'm not a mental health first aider at, at the firm I work for. But being a family lawyer, most of your clients are going through something tough and their emotions all over the place. They're probably suffering from depression, all sorts. So it's really helpful in my line of work just to be aware of what they could be going through. Not so that I can necessarily help them, but so I can signpost them to an expert that can help if I think they need it. Yeah, but I also think it's you, you can also sort of empathise and, and meet them perhaps where they're at. And you, you have had some foundational you know, training uh, around that, you know, so I think it's it's great that you're almost going the extra mile um, to, to be there for your for your clients. So, so let's talk about social media then, because, you know, on your Instagram page, which is very impressive, you know, at London Family Solicitor, you educate your follow- followers on a number of sort of hot topics regarding family law. What are some of the most common misconceptions or myth about family law you aim to debunk with your content? So, First of all, family law, and this is aimed at aspiring lawyers rather than lay, and lay people going through divorce or separation. Family law can be a very lucrative career and can give you very good exposure to international high stake work and high net worth clients. Now, through my Instagram account, I try to show aspiring family lawyers or barristers that being a family lawyer is not just an office job, but can involve so much more, such as traveling to international conferences, attending events around the country, even out at sea. I was out at sea last year being very social with the family law community and working from home and around the world. So that that's the first aim of my social media account, just to really show people what family law can really be like. And then secondly, for those going through a family law dispute, my Instagram posts break down, or at least I intend them to break down law into bite-sized pieces, a bit like a university revision book so that people can better understand their rights without having to pay lawyers for essentially basic information. So they're the two reasons, really. And then in terms of common misconceptions, I'll get there's loads, but the top ones probably are people often think that if their spouse has committed adultery, they'll get a less favorable financial settlement and divorce. That's not true. 
um, if they have been living together with their partner for many years and have children but are unmarried, people think that they'll be considered a common law spouse. Not true. Uh, prenuptial agreements, people think are legally binding. Not true. There's lots, but hopefully the posts on my uh, Instagram account will tell them what is actually true and what isn't. And yeah, absolutely. I would encourage people to go and check those out as well. Um, but also in your Legal Cheek blog, uh, post titled, How Aspiring Lawyers Can Make the Most of Instagram, you outline nine top tips. What are the benefits of law students creating an Instagram page? So I think there's quite a few. I got a bit of backlash for that, but I wouldn't expect anything else from Legal Cheek to be honest. But I think there's quite a few. So Students, they can follow the law firms that they're interested in on Instagram, and loads of law firms are on Instagram, so they can keep up to date with what's happening at that law firm, any job opportunities or vacation schemes, and they can also directly message the law firm, unlikely they'll respond, but they can, or, more probably importantly and relevant, they can engage with them by commenting on their posts and stories, just getting their name out there on their Instagram, so that's the first thing, I think. Second, they can follow pages that provide legal CV help um, and legal career help to help them through their own journey and help them find a role. That's quite valuable. Uh, three, they can follow uh, legal recruiters. There's quite a few on there who can help them find a role. And again, they can directly message them through Instagram. Uh, four, they can follow Instagram pages like mine in an area that they want to you know, pursue to get a better understanding of what it's really like working as a lawyer in a particular field. And then they can follow other aspiring solicitors, lawyers, barristers who are going through the same journey as them. And they can share their experiences, share their tips, share revision guides and just, you know, be part of a community before actually physically stepping into that world. So there is a great legal community out there on Instagram and more and more professionals and law firms are joining every day. And I think you know, aspiring family lawyers should be on it. Why not? What, what harm could it really do? Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. There is a great community building in the legal world, particularly on, on Instagram and, and online generally. And people are there. But if you chuck yourself in to help, to get support, guidance, resources, um, you know, ask those silly questions that are not silly questions. And yeah, all of that good stuff, I think, is, uh, is really, really helpful. So since you started your career, have you noticed any emerging trends or significant changes in family law? If so, tell us more. Yes, but there's been quite a few. Um, I mean, the biggest one, so I'll start with that, is no-fault divorce. So prior to the 6th of April 2022, in order to get a divorce, you had to blame your spouse for the divorce or wait a certain number of years, two or five years, before you can apply for a divorce. But now we have no-fault divorce where one or both spouses can apply for a divorce um, jointly or to get uh, singly, and they don't need to blame the other. So that's been a massive change. Um, and a really welcome change. That's the first big one. The second one, prenuptial agreements. They are being taken more and more seriously by the courts. And there was a recent case on this this, this year, which suggests that. So that's one to watch how that will develop. Um, next one, the rise of private hearings. Um, so the court is so backlogged um, and has been for a long time. And many judges just don't have the time to give each case the attention it needs or deserves and sometimes doesn't even have the time to read the papers before the case starts so more and more people are therefore paying for private judges or arbitrators to read all the papers in their case and carefully listen to them and listen to their barristers if they have representation and determine the outcome so i do a lot of private fdrs now and then i'd say uh probably the next one is the desire to have more transparency in the family courts now. So in February 2023, a new era began for the family courts following the launch of a pilot scheme that allows reporters into the courtroom, family courtroom. So the pilot scheme hopes to enhance transparency, meaning that journalists will be able to report much more freely on what takes place in, in the family courts during certain family hearings. So I'd say they, those are the big ones. Yeah, and they are huge. I think there's some some real developments there. Um, you know, I think um, you know, just imagine journalists coming in, and you know, all of that. There's a a real sea change from what it would have been years and years ago. That's uh, that's for sure. Um, so in your opinion, Yasmin, what are some of the key qualities that make successful family laws? It's a far-reaching question, that. But in my opinion, I'd say the following: um, listening to your client and not presuming. So a family lawyer must actively listen to their clients and understand what they want from the process, their key objectives. So for some, 
It may be important to remain in the family home. For others, it may be more important to keep their pension untouched. Or for some, it may be to reach a financial settlement outside of court as quickly as possible. And for others, and I've genuinely seen this, it could be to proceed to a final hearing, doesn't matter how much it costs, so that they have their day in court. So it's really important at the outset, first meeting, to ask your client, what are your key objectives here? Because everyone's answer is different and it's surprising. So it's that, that would be number one. Then two, so we've touched upon this, empathy, but also robustness. So a family lawyer needs to show their client empathy and compassion, but at the same time, they must remain level-headed and must not let their emotions uh, distract them from their role. A client often seeks the reassurance in a family lawyer, often treats and often treats us like therapists or you know a GP. But we need to remain impartial. We need to know when to signpost them to the correct professional, um, and we need to give them realistic and practical direction and not get too caught up in the emotional side. Um, so that's important. And then. Some probably obvious ones, excellent communication skills and ability to cut through lots of information and summarize the important points. Particularly if you're dealing with finance and some divorce, you're gonna be given lots of financial disclosure. You need to know, you know, I'm talking 800, 900 pages. You need to know how to get through it quickly, picking out the pertinent parts. Good at negotiating, drafting, following court procedures, not missing court deadlines, uh, researching, uh, keeping on top of client invoices. So one that people probably don't think of, you really need to, predict for your clients future legal costs and plan accordingly so that they're not left in lots of debt and they're, they're well informed about where their finances are and uh, what their legal fees are. It's really important. In addition to, I'd say, all of those, family lawyers need to be good at networking, marketing themselves and their law firm, business development and fostering relationships with potential referrers. So really all-rounded, all-rounded person. Yeah, I think you give them some really, really good casing uh examples there and also you're absolutely right on 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 billing and a lot of people know we we work with clio you know we sponsor the show i think they have some some really interesting sort of features that that can help with that some good plugins with some of these legal tech providers because you're right things really educate clients and all of that good stuff and taboo topics need to be discussed so with that um what would be your sort of one piece of advice to aspiring solicitors looking to specialise in family law? You've given some great examples throughout, mentioned around Instagram, et cetera, et cetera. But what would be your sort of one key piece of advice for anyone looking to aspire to specialise in family law? It's more an amalgamation of a couple of pieces of advice. So pick um, the module at university, family law, or failing that, pick it at the LPC to see whether you like it. That's got to be a starting point, right? Then try to obtain some work experience in the family law field, whether that's volunteering during the holiday or paid roles such as a legal assistant, do what you can to try and actively get in the role. Read, if you can't, read familylawweek.co.uk. It's great. It gives you good access to all the latest family law news, judgments and articles and things like that. And then decide whether you need to, whether you wish to specialise in public family law, as we touched on earlier, or private family law. Um, public family law is normally always legal aid work and private family law is normally always not. But it's good to distinguish because law firms have very separate departments. Some law firms don't do public family law at all. And finally, follow my Instagram page if you really want to know what it's like to be a family lawyer. Yeah, and that leads nicely on. So I was going to say, if people want to follow you, get in touch about anything you discussed today, obviously follow your Instagram's page, feel free to give it one more shout out. And then also any web links or anything else you'd like us to share, we'll share them in this episode point two. I also have a guide on the Instagram page, which I made specifically for aspiring family lawyers. So it's under the guide section and lots of helpful information there if you're looking for a career in family law. Perfect. And that is at London Family Solicitor. So Yasmin, I've had an absolute blast uh, listening to your journey, le- learning more about what you're getting up to and all the value you're doing to give back to the uh, community. So it's been a real pleasure having you on the show. So for now, from all of us on the League Speak podcast, wishing you lots of success with your career. But for now, over and out. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. If you like the content here, why not check out our world-leading content and collaboration hub the legally speaking club over on discord go to our website www.legallyspeakingpodcast.com for the link to join our community there over and out